Hello friends, happy Monday. Welcome back to yet another weekly reading vlog. In a very exciting turn of events, it's not really a turn of events, but whatever, I couldn't think of another phrase. But very excitingly, this is the last weekly reading vlog um, of 2022 where I am working because I'm officially off for Christmas starting next Wednesday. And so I'm so excited, so, so, so fucking excited to just have some extended time off from work. But to walk you through what I'm reading, the answer is I'm not actually currently working on anything because last week I finished Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and I have been in a major, major slump ever since. I have not been able to consume any story, any story in any medium, manga, TV, books. I did finish an audiobook, but it was a reread. So like, it doesn't really count, I feel. But I really just like, I feel like that game has like altered my brain chemistry and I don't know what to do with myself. But like, I don't know what to do because like, I can't, I can't relive that for the first time ever again. And so like, here I am. But what I have been doing since is I've been reliving my feelings through listening to the soundtrack. And so like, I feel like I've given it a few days. I'm still listening to the OST. Maybe I can like throw in some reading along with listening to the soundtrack. You know what I'm saying? Um, in terms of what I'm reading, this is about the time of the year where I start to try to clear my currently reading list. Um, I have a lot of currently readings. I, I I don't know how I'm gonna get through them by the end of the year. Um, and I also don't know if I'm in the headspace for any of my currently readings, but let me talk you through the two that I'm like actively, like I actually think I need to finish these this year. Um, and the first one is The Children of Chaos by Trudy Skies. This is the second book in the Cruel God series. If you watched one of my vlogs from maybe like a few weeks ago, I read The 13th Hour, which is the first book in this series. And I absolutely loved it. It gave me like major arcane vibes. I actually compared it thematically a little bit to Xenoblade as well. So maybe this is a good time to get back into the book. I don't know. I think the only thing that's like holding me back from it is that I really started uh, annotating quite heavily and tabbing quite heavily when I started this book. However, that requires me to do some thinking and I just like, I don't want to use brain cells like that. Um, but I also don't want to abandon my annotation efforts like partway into the book. So I don't know. I don't know about this one um, for this week. Um, the second one is The Spear Cuts Through Water by Simon Jimenez. Uh, I started this probably about a month ago now, maybe longer. Um, and I haven't made any progress in it ever since I last talked about it. And I probably have to return this back to the library soon. Um, I've already renewed it twice. So <laughs> I think my luck is running out and I just need to finish this book. Um, but again, this is one of those very, very big brain books. And I just don't know if I'm like capable of handling it right now. Um, however, I do have a third option and this is the option that I think is best for my brain right now. And it is Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation. This is volume one, which I've already read. Um, but I do want to reread before I move into volumes three and four, which I just purchased recently. And so maybe I will tackle this this week? I don't know. I really don't know. It's it's been a weird time, but I figured it's a good time to start a vlog as well because I always find that vlogging helps like center me in terms of like focusing my efforts on one particular book or something like that. Maybe, sort of, not really. So as you can tell, it's probably going to take me a couple of days to at least like find what I'm going to read. Um, but as always, I'll keep you updated and I'll let you know what I end up picking up. Hello friends, happy Tuesday. It's already after lunch. It's been a hectic morning at work. And then I spent the lunch hour filming and doing a little bit of editing and it's been a whole thing. Um, in terms of updates, I don't have much to update because I did only read about maybe like a hundred pages last night, but I did decide to pick up uh, The Children of Chaos again, just because I feel like this book fits the vibe of the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 soundtrack the best out of all the options that I had. And I'm actually really glad that I picked this up because I am really enjoying it still. Um, it's just a lot of fun. I have kind of let up on the annotating a bit. I'm still tabbing a little bit, but I've kind of relaxed on the annotating a little bit just so I can just like focus on reading and having fun with it. Um, and I just really want to finish this before the year end to determine if this series might be a new favorite for me. I don't know. I don't know. It's It's got potential. It definitely has a lot of potential. Definitely a standout for the year, 100%, especially like new to me authors, 100%. The other thing though is I do have to go into the office tomorrow and I have to be out and about tomorrow. So I do want to find an ebook to read so that I can have a book with me on the go tomorrow or an audiobook. I'm not sure. I'll let you know when I decide. I'm sorry this check-in 
was like very chaotic and very short. I didn't really have much to say other than that I'm still enjoying this. I do wish this had an audiobook though so that I could take it with me on the go, but unfortunately I can't. Um, so here we are. Um, anyway, that was it for this check-in and I will see you at the next one. Hello friends! It is later in the evening. I've just finished dinner and I have some exciting book mail. It's my first ever book of the month box. It's also my last ever because I don't know for me it's just like not worth the continued expense but I did want to try it out because obviously it's all over the interwebs and I wanted to join in on the hype train. The first book which I mentioned in my last vlog I was going to be getting is Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran. I read The Charm Offensive last week, two weeks ago, I don't even remember and I really really enjoyed it so I'm really excited to get to this. Honestly part of me thinks Will I just start this instead of reading my currently readings? What is being responsible? Am I right? And then the second book I picked up I've been wanting to read ever since it came out. I love the cover um, and it is The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas, I think is how you pronounce her name. I could be wrong. I don't speak Spanish. I need to check this. Please correct me if I'm wrong and I am so sorry if I am. But this is an interesting one because I've actually seen very very mixed reviews about this. However, I know that this is like gothic literature and I know that anytime I see gothic literature kind of gain some sort of like mainstream attention, I feel like there's always mixed reviews because I do feel like gothic literature is boring. If you are not used to it and if you don't like slow paced no plot vibes only books I don't think gothic literature really is for you. However it's very much for me and so even when I watch negative reviews of this book they're always just like it's so boring nothing happens and I'm like this sounds right up my alley. I'm very excited to read this. All I really know about this is that there is some sort of a forbidden priest romance situation. There is a haunted house of some sorts and it takes place in Mexico during the War of Independence. Uh, other than that I know nothing about it. Uh, I don't know what the plot is supposed to be, if there is even supposed to be a plot, because like I said it is gothic so there might not be a plot to be quite honest with you. I guess I will sanitize these books and then maybe start Kiss Her Once for me? I don't know. I'll let you know. You'll see in my next check-in it might be tomorrow, it might be the day after because like I said tomorrow is gonna be hectic. I have to go into the office, I have my annual performance review, my first annual performance review at this new company that I'm with. It is nerve-wracking nerve-wracking nerve -wracking, let me tell you. I feel fairly confident that I'm not gonna be like fired or anything like that but like I don't know these sorts of meetings just like give me a lot of anxiety they put me on edge so I actually don't know how much I'm gonna be reading tonight I don't know if I'll just end up playing a game just to keep my mind off of things um I don't know we'll see we'll see but I will check in with you possibly tomorrow but most likely Thursday morning. happy Thursday. It feels like a Friday but it's only a Thursday. <laughs> I am exhausted. I was out all day yesterday obviously because I had to be at work in the office and then I also went out for dinner um, and stopped by the Christmas market which hopefully I got some footage of um, but I am honestly just so exhausted. Like I came home and I meant to like lie in bed and read because I got home probably at around 9 30 9 45 ish and then I laid down in bed after I showered to read um, and I literally just fell asleep until 2 a.m by accident and I'm just so pooped. But to give you a quick update on my reading um, on audio yesterday I did start The Alchemist of Loom by Elise Kova. I came across this one when I was on my like steam punk fantasy search last month um, and I came across this one and it was on Hoopla um, and so I just like borrowed it to start listening to it. I don't really have much thoughts on it yet other than it's okay I'm enjoying it enough but I don't know if I'm enjoying it enough to like continue reading it. I don't know if I like all the POVs because I think so far there's been like one two three four POVs and I just don't know if I'm in the mood for like a super multi POV type of type of fantasy right now. Also if I sound super congested I don't know why I just suddenly became congested when the camera came on. Um, so that's why I sound like this but I did want to give you updates on Kiss Her Once For Me. Um, I'm almost halfway through the book and 
I have thoughts. I have very, very conflicted opinions about this book so far. Um, let's start with the positive because I am enjoying this quite a lot. I'm enjoying the characters a lot. I think the character work is much better than in the Charm Offensive. I think the side characters feel more like real people. I would say there is like a secondary romance in this book that I personally don't really care for. But aside from that, I'm really enjoying the book. I really like the setup. I really like the characters, the family. I don't think I actually said what this book is about. So let me quickly give you a summary. But basically, this is a single POV so far. Um, romance novel where we follow our main character, Ellie. She, the year prior, uh, moved from Ohio to Portland to chase her dreams of being an animator. She started working at an animation studio and was quickly let go from the studio. And around that same time, so the previous Christmas, she also had a one night stand with this woman named Jack. Um, and basically that didn't really work out, but she kind of fell in love like immediately after one night. Um, and so she still hung up on her. And so her love life is kind of shit. Her work life is kind of shit. Um, she works at this coffee shop now. And what ends up happening is that she is basically now in a situation where she really needs money. Like her rent is going up. She can't afford to pay rent. She's making basically minimum wage. And one day the like landlord sort of of her coffee shop that she works at, he takes her out for drinks. They have drinks and he ends up revealing to her that his grandfather recently passed away. And to, in order to inherit his $2 million, um, he actually needs to get married. <laughs> and so she jokingly suggests like that he should get into like a fake marriage, like a marriage of convenience. And he's like, Oh my god, you're, so you're a genius. Would you like to be my fiance, like my fake fiance? And she's just like, you're out of your goddamn mind. Um, but then he offers her 10% of his inheritance so $200,000. And so she obviously can't pass that up. So she ends up taking him up on that. Um, and one of the caveats, which is what we're in now, is that she has to spend Christmas with his family um, in their cabin. Turns out when she gets there, his sister is actually the woman that she fell in love with the previous Christmas. And so obviously Ellie is now in this dilemma where she's like, you know, do I follow my heart and like go for this girl that I fell in love with last year? Or do I be practical and like continue this like fake marriage situation so that I can get $200,000? I'm really enjoying the characters and the setup of this book. Ellie is a very relatable character. I think a lot of us can relate to kind of feeling like we are not living the lives that we thought we would lead. She has generalized anxiety disorder and she has panic attacks occasionally. So I think for me, that's also very relatable. She also has a very difficult relationship with her parents. And by that, I mean her parents are awful. She really just is one of those characters that you can't help but root for and like. Um, so I really, really enjoy her. I really enjoy Andrew as well, her like fake fiance. Um, he is hilarious. <laughs> He's basically like a jock who like refuses to stop jocking but also like wants to do better and like he's just so funny and like I really like their little dynamic, their banter. As a love triangle enthusiast, I really wish this book would lean into her having a love triangle with like the brother and the sister, but I really don't feel like that's going in that direction. <laughs> so unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna happen for me, but like I do understand that like I'm one of the like few people who actually loves love triangles. <laughs> the other kind of character standouts to me are the grandmothers. They are just so funny. They're so charming and sweet. I really, really love them. I low-key think that they are perhaps lesbians with each other. Um, I really like them a lot. <laughs> um, and so I'm just really enjoying the characters in this book quite a lot. I think, again, I think this is a big improvement on the charm offensive on that front. But with that being said, let's move into the negatives because there are a few things that are genuinely negatively impacting my enjoyment. And let's start with the least offensive, which is that there are kind of like interlude chapters here. Basically, Ellie is a artist. And so she, in order to kind of like process the things that happens in her life, she's kind of made like web comics. Um, and there are segments of this book that are kind of like the web comic. And I have a huge problem with how they're presented, okay? My problem is this. They're not presented to us as web comics. They are just presented to us as like a piece of fiction, like a piece of prose fiction. My problem with this is that web comics and like written prose are like two very, very different mediums. Um, and so it just does not translate to me. Like you can't give me a chunk of text 
and call it a webcomic and tell me that it's a webcomic because it's not. I would obviously prefer for it to actually be presented as a webcomic, but I understand that like maybe an illustrator was not in the budget, like that's totally fine. But then I wish it was either presented as either like panels and like the text that would have gone on each panel or not have it be a webcomic at all. Make it a fucking web novel. Those exist, you know? And so like it just really irritates me. I don't know why whenever I read one of those chapters and it's like so clearly just like a regular old like, you know, narrated piece of fiction. And I'm just like, this is not anything close to what a web novel would read like. I don't know, like it's just this one minor little detail that like really irritates me. Um, and so for my own personal enjoyment, I'm just pretending that they're not webcomics and that it's a web novel. That is what I'm choosing to do in order to like not be pissed off about it. The second thing, and this is very much a me problem, I fully recognize this, is that there are an excessive amount of pop culture references in this book. And that is just something that I personally dislike in contemporary fiction. I think that A, it really dates your book, and B, I think I just find it generally cringy because like I am not the type of person to casually bring up pop culture references in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I don't really know them or understand them, and so like when I read it in a book I find it cringy because like you're assuming that your reader is also very clued in to these specific pop culture references and I think that it alienates readers when you're not. And even when I do understand the pop culture references I still don't like them. Like again I just find it cringy personally. The other thing specifically is that the main characters Jack and Ellie they are both Swifties um, and so a lot of the pop culture references are Taylor Swift references and I am so sorry to say uh, I'm a hater. I don't like Taylor Swift. I have nothing against her personally, obviously. I don't know her. But like, I don't like her music and I especially don't like how much it is shoved down my throat as someone who does not like her. <laughs> as a person, I generally just don't like being like overexposed to something that I don't seek out and it just makes me dislike it more and Taylor Swift is one of those things in entertainment that is, I feel, unavoidable. Like, I can't escape her. And it's very irritating to me as someone who is not a fan of her music whatsoever that like I have to see her everywhere all the fucking time. It is very very irritating to me. Every time I see a fucking Taylor Swift reference in this book I want to like throw it across the room because I'm so fucking annoyed about it. Obviously I know that is a me problem. Like I get it. I am irrationally <laughs> annoyed by this and irritated by this. However it is negatively impacting my enjoyment of the book. And like I said it's not just the Taylor Swift references. It's just all the pop culture references in general. Um, are grading. Third, and perhaps I think the most like conflicting thing for me is that Jack and Andrew, the two siblings, they are Korean American. Um, and I just feel a little weird about it, to be quite honest with you, because if we consider the fact that Dev in the term offensive is Indian American, Alison Cochran is now two for two for writing Asian American main characters, and I just have to question why. Like, I... Here's the thing, like, I don't necessarily think that white authors can't write BIPOC characters, like not at all. But I just personally feel a little weird about it, to be quite honest with you. I just feel like if this is a pattern for her, I think that that's not something that I personally can be on board with. Like I don't feel like white people should make a career out of writing BIPOC stories. I will say to her credit, it does seem like she's taken on a lot of the criticisms from book one. It did feel like a bulk of the criticism came from the fact that people felt like Dev did not feel like an Indian American main character and he felt like a white character or some a character that was originally written as white and then retconned as Indian American for diversity points. Um, that's what a lot of people say about it. Obviously I can't speak to that representation but I can definitely see why those criticisms were made for sure. And then the second criticism, which is like so sort of related, is that um, Dev has POV chapters in that book. And some people felt like she shouldn't have written from his POV um, because it just didn't feel genuine. And I also feel like that's a valid criticism. And so interestingly, in this book, she doesn't have any POVs from Jack's um, perspective or that I've seen so far. Like it's exclusively written from Ellie's POV. And I don't think you can actually make the argument in this book that Jack was written originally as a white character. Like I don't feel that way about Jack as a character, whereas I can definitely see that argument for Dev. So I do want to give credit where credit is due. It does seem like Alison Cochran has taken on that criticism. 
Um, and I want to be very clear that nothing jumps out at me in this book as being offensive. Like, nothing feels offensive in the portrayal of these characters. Again, I'm not Korean-American, so take the, all this with a grain of salt. Um, but nothing that I have seen is feels offensive. I think it's just the principle of it makes me uncomfortable, especially because there has been, like, a slight mention of it. Um, and I'm really hoping it doesn't come up more, to be quite honest with you. But they did mention briefly, basically, Jack wore, like, a Stop Asian Hate t-shirt. And I'm like, I really don't need, quite frankly, a stop Asian hate, like, discussion in this book. I really just personally do not need a white person's perspective on the Asian American struggle, personally. You can disagree with me. I, that is totally fine. I'm totally okay with that. Like, I understand that this is a personal thing for me. I just really, really, really hope that this book will not be diving into that because that honestly would just give me the ick. And I just feel very, very conflicted about this because again, like I said, I think objectively, I don't feel like there's anything super bad or offensive about the the representation in this book. And it does look like she had um, sensitivity readers at the very least. So I'm glad at least that there is that. Um, but I just think for me personally, it just feels a little weird. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I don't think I've explained it very well. Um, but anyway, I have to go to work now. And so I will sign off here. I will probably check in with you once I have finished the book, because I think I can finish it today. Um, or if I have like any major updates, I will let you know. Um, I'm hoping that I can kind of like readjust my kind of mental framing for this book uh, so that certain things don't bother me as much and so that I can just dive into the characters and just enjoy the like actual meat and bones of the story. But we'll see. Um, I will let you know um, when I finish the book. Hello friends! Happy Friday! I actually don't have reading updates yet. Remember how I so confidently said I think I can finish the book yesterday? We're gonna pretend I didn't do that. We're gonna pretend I did not say that. However, I do have some book mail. I do know what this is. This is a pre-order. Um, so I do already know what it is, but I completely forgot that this was coming out this week. Um, so I was really surprised to see it on my doorstep. Also, we had a massive storm here yesterday. So I also didn't think it would even arrive this week, but it is, of course, <laughs> the fourth volume of Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation. I think in my last vlog, I mentioned that I recently purchased volumes two and three in the series and I need to continue on. And I did pre-order volumes four and five while they were on sale for $16 because I think that's just a much more reasonable price for these books. I really love the color for this one though. It's quite soft. And then also we have Jiang Cheng and Yan Ni on the back, which I love. I love them. I know Jiang Cheng is not like... <laughs> a well-loved character in the fandom or like he's a very polarizing character but I really really like him I just think he's such an interesting character I think that's what I like about him the most oh my god look at them they're so beautiful <laughs> I really do like the inner illustrations I think even in volume one the inside illustrations were all really really spectacular oh my god I'm going to cry if you know you know but like they're little <laughs> look at them they're so cute Oh, I think once I finish Kiss Her Once For Me, I'm going to start my reread of volume one and then I'll continue on in the series. And then maybe that'll be my like Christmas project because I don't have a Christmas book this year. I have talked about this briefly before, maybe on like a live stream or something. But basically for the last couple of Christmases, I've been reading the Dandelion Dynasty and obviously I finished that this year and I don't have any more Dandelion Dynasty. I don't have my like usual go-to Christmas book anymore. And so I feel a little bit of like sadness about this and I don't know why. It's so silly it's not even like a tradition but I don't know like I just really enjoyed ending off the year on like a such a high note for the last two years and just spending my Christmas holidays like taking a proper break from work and just enjoying a book that I love so much I just feel like if I don't find a book to replace that in my in my holiday roster I'm just gonna I'm gonna be like a little sad about it um but anyway that is it for this check-in obviously a very quick one just wanted to show you of course my new book um but I will hopefully hopefully check in later tonight once I finished kiss her once for me fingers crossed for me we shall see Good morning, friends. Happy Saturday. I'm doing a quick check-in just before I head off to my parents for lunch. Um, I am very proud to say that I did indeed finish Kiss Her Once For Me by Alison Cochran last night. Um, I actually like flew through the last half of this book. Like I, I think it took me like 
maybe a couple of hours to read the last half. Like, this is a very compulsively readable. I will say that Alison Cochran's writing in general, across the two books that I've read of hers, have been very, very compulsively readable. Um, and overall, despite my gripes with this book, which I've already talked about, and I'm not going to talk about them again, I still continue to have the same issues with it. But despite those issues, I still loved this book. <laughs> um, and I ended up giving it four out of five stars. I think if it were not for a few of the issues I had with it, this could have been higher, this could have maybe been like 4.5. But unfortunately, it's just not quite there. I also did specifically find some of the descriptors in this book to be repetitive, like she does reuse certain words quite a lot. And it does kind of take you out of the moment once you start realizing it's happening. Um, but if you don't realize it's happening, I don't think you notice it. I will say just to confirm what didn't happen is that we didn't actually get a whole stop Asian hate storyline, which I'm very, very, very glad we didn't. Because again, like I said before, like I just don't need a white author writing about the Asian American struggle. Like I really don't. There are moments in the book where race and racism are briefly mentioned. I, again, I don't know how I feel about it. I think there's just like a part of it where when it comes from a non-lived experience, some of the things are a little bit cringy, to be quite honest with you. And I just like, I just don't know how I feel about it in general on principle. But again, I don't think there was anything in the book that stuck out to me personally as like, of offensive or anything like that. So I don't want people to like have this takeaway of like, I think that this book is offensive. Like I don't, I absolutely don't. But I just think that I personally question kind of the motives behind why the author feels like she as a white woman needs to be telling these stories. Like I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, aside from that, like, I don't want to dwell on the negatives about this book. I do want to talk about the positives. I fundamentally just really like the characters. I think the characters, um, not just the two main characters, but the entire cast of characters are very, very likable. Like, even characters I didn't really like in the beginning, um, like Dylan, I didn't really care for them for, like, a good chunk of the book. But by the end, I actually ended up really enjoying Dylan's character, the little bit that we saw of them. Um, and like I said, the grandmothers, especially Mima, Mima and Lovey, like, I need, I need a spinoff. I need a grandma spinoff like I really really desperately need that in my life and Andrew as well like I just really like his character I really want more from him um really love his mom Catherine I just feel like as Ellie was getting to know this family I was also getting to know this family and I just feel like the characters were so well done in this book um and I know that some people are going to have issues with the romance I'm not gonna lie I will put this out there I think that some people who are very averse to insta love um are gonna be not happy with this romance because it is very insta lovey i personally think that there's a way to do insta love right i think that in this book it was believable to me personally um but i do again i do see uh, a lot of people having issues with it so if that is something that you don't enjoy, if you don't enjoy an insta love trope, this may not be the book for you, to be quite frank. I think if you're also not a fan of the like miscommunication trope, or like you just really, really don't like it. Again, it's not a trope that I typically like, and I usually don't like it. But I think the context for why they couldn't tell each other certain things in this book definitely made sense. And one of the things is less of a miscommunication and more of a misunderstanding, which I think is reasonable. Um, I definitely felt like it was done well in this book. But again, if that is a trope that you are like, absolutely fucking not, I hate it. Um, I would also think twice about picking up this book because again, it is a prominent thing where, you know, they aren't really telling each other a lot of things. I think also ethically, if you think about this a little bit harder, it's a little, it's a little questionable. It's a little bit questionable because for all intents and purposes, Jack thinks that Ellie is her brother's fiance. And so she's like openly flirting with her brother's fiance. And even though you know, as the reader, that their relationship is fake, it's a little bit morally questionable. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't personally care about that kind of stuff when I read my romance, but if that is gonna bother you, Again, that is something to keep in mind. But I do think that if those are not things that like you think will completely turn you off the book, I definitely think you should give this a try. Like the characters are just so lovable. I think that the um, anxiety rep in this book is so, so good. Like Ellie is so relatable to me. Like Ellie is 25 in this book and she reminds me of me when I was 25. And I just like, I really felt for her. And I just really, really related to a lot of what she was going to that 
immense fear of failure, of feeling like nothing you ever do is good enough and that everything you do is bound to end up in failure and how that fear absolutely stops you from living your best life, basically. And I just think that Ellie is just such a great main character who is going to be like really relatable to many many people um and I just really loved it for that there's this overall just like message of like chasing your dreams and like believing in yourself and like overcoming fears and I just think that's a really great book for the holidays because of those themes and I don't know I just really really enjoyed it despite again some of my issues with it like I really I got I just gotta get it off my chest I do definitely wish that the flashback chapters weren't written as a quote-unquote webcomic not webcomic um and it was just literally just flashback chapters um but I do really like the flashback chapters in that I like that they kind of mirrored what was happening in the present day I really like when flashbacks do that regardless I really recommend this but aside from that like I said I am headed to my parents and I did actually just get the audiobook for Genesis of Misery by Neon Yang which has been on my TBR for shamefully way too long because I did get an e-arc of it and I just still haven't read it because I have no excuses. I have no excuses. I don't know why I haven't read it. But I do have the audiobook now, so I think I'm going to pop that on on the audiobook. I think I'm going to low-key give up on Alchemist's of Loom. I don't think it's a bad book. I just don't think I was interested enough in, like, the premise and the setup to continue on. Maybe one day, if I'm, like, really bored, I'll come back to it. Um, but as of right now, I just don't think it's what I'm in the mood for. Um... But regardless, I will check in with you maybe later today, maybe tomorrow, and let you know what I get up to in terms of my reading. Um, I don't know how much reading I'll be able to get done because I did just acquire another new game yesterday and I have started it and I'm absolutely hooked. The story is incredible. It's like an epic fantasy type of story, like super political. And I feel like that game is like currently scratching my fantasy itch. And so like I don't feel like I'm going to be picking up another like fantasy book right now. But again, I will keep you posted and I will see you at the next check-in. Hello friends! Happy Monday! I think this is going to be my last check-in just because I really don't think I'm going to get much more reading done this week. I didn't actually get too much reading done yesterday. I did uh, get some of my audiobook read of Genesis of Misery by Neon Yang and I am 25% of the way through it and I don't know if I'm going to be continuing on in this book to be quite honest with you. I quite frankly feel like a lot of this book is going over my head because I am not fully, it's not even just that I don't fully grasp the religious references, it's that I don't want to, quite frankly. I realized earlier this year when I was reading Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents is that I, while I like religious themes in my fantasies, I don't specifically like super biblical stuff. Um, and in Parable of the Sower, it's the same as in Genesis of Misery, where I know that the author is subverting certain Christian themes and like Christian things. But I still just don't like reading biblical language. It's weird because I really love the Locked Tomb series, which has a lot of biblical references. But I feel like in Locked Tomb, it's not as in your face. And it's very much like more fun about the way that it pokes fun at Christianity. Whereas like kind of the more serious um, subversions of, of Christianity are just like a little too much for me. Like I just, it's just not something that I personally enjoy. It's something that I now perhaps realizing that maybe I, it's not something I like. But if you don't know what Genesis of Misery is about, to be honest, I don't even really know either. But it was originally pitched as Joan of Arc meets Gundam. This was the pitch before it was actually like acquired. Um, I saw this first on Twitter um, when Neon Yang tweeted this out. Um, and they were just like, what if I wrote a book about Joan of Arc, but like, in a Gundam setting. And I was like, amazing. That sounds amazing. But they must have scrapped the Gundam comp because like, I don't feel like it's like the most well known IP, even though it's like very, very popular in Asia. Um, but so far, I haven't seen many like mechs yet. I have seen in other reviews, people compare it to Pacific Rim though, which is obviously um, mecha as well. So I do think that like mechs must come in at some point in the book. I don't feel like I've seen any. There was like a battle sequence at the beginning, but like I don't really remember much of it to be honest with you because if you know me at all like space opera battle sequences often just like fly over my head like I just can't I, I struggle to follow along but basically the the setup of the story is very much similar to Joan of Arc in that Misery who is our kind of like Joan of Arc character um she is experiencing these these 
hallucinations of an angel called Ruin, um, and they think that they are just going through, like, something called the void sickness, which is something her mother suffered from. And she thinks it's just, like, a symptom of that. And they're from this, like, poor mining colony in their world in space. Um, and basically there's like this holy war going on at the time where there's like the faithful and then there's like the heretics and then she gets basically like taken in by like the faithful because they think that Misery is like the messiah and so like Misery just starts playing along with it even though she fully thinks that the voices that she's hearing are part of this illness she's obviously like not telling them. That's basically the setup of the story. I don't think I explained it very well. Um, I genuinely think that the book does not set up the story very well. I don't feel like the book sets it up in a way where if you don't know the Joan of Arc story, you will understand what's going on. I just feel like there's a lot of gaps that you have to fill in yourself. And like, while I am vaguely familiar with Joan of Arc, I am not that familiar with Joan of Arc. So I also found it a little difficult to figure out what was going on. Again, that could just be me like not being good at sci-fi books and like space operas in particular, but I do find it a little confusing to follow along. What I'm now realizing about Neon Dang's writing is that while I love their writing and their world building, I find find that their plots are very, very subpar. And because their plots don't really work for me personally, I find that whether or not I like a book of theirs very much hinges on how much I enjoy the characters. So for example, The Black Tides of Heaven, I really didn't care for because I didn't really care for the characters, but Red Threads of Fortune is one of my favorite novellas, okay? Like it's a five-star novella. I fucking love that novella. And even though, again, the plot is very like whatever, the characters are what makes that book so good to me. And the third book in that series as well, even though I didn't really love the plot or anything, I actually really liked the character POV that we got. I thought that that character was like super, super interesting and they had a really distinctive voice. Um, I find the same here. The narrator in Genesis of Misery um, is someone. We don't actually know who the narrator is, um, but they are telling the story from Misery's point of view. And so they are very like intimately familiar with Misery and their kind of like thought processes. But we don't actually know who the narrator is, whether it's Misery or it's someone else. My suspicion as of right now is that it's Ruin, like the angel that's speaking in her head. I find that the voice of the narrator, similarly to the third book in the Tensorate series, is very, very distinct and has a lot of personality, which is a pro and a con. Because on the one hand, I can see how that is like good writing. But on the other hand, I don't like this character. I don't, I find this character, quite frankly, kind of irritating. And so like, I don't really like the narrator. I don't like the voice that this entire book is written in. And I think Misery for me is not interesting enough of a character to carry this book right now. Again, I think this book heavily relies on you being able to fill in the gaps of the Joan of Arc storyline. And so Misery feels a little underdeveloped to me at this point in the book. Um, I know I'm only 25% of the way in, but I do feel like it's just not quite there. I hate to be so negative about it because again, like I'm not not liking my time as I'm reading it. Like every time I think I'm going to DNF it, something happens and I'm like, oh, okay, like maybe, maybe I'll continue on, you know? There's this princess character that I'm like vaguely interested in. I've forgotten her name because I'm reading it audibly. So like I, I struggle to remember names when I, when I can't see them on paper, but basically she She's the one who captures and attacks Misery and brings them back to the Faithfuls, um, kind of like space station thingy. Um, and I feel like it's supposed to be set up as like a, like enemies to lovers kind of storyline. Um, but I also feel like knowing Neon Yang, it's not going to be that simple. Um, so I'm vaguely interested in that kind of plot line. Um, but overall, the like kind of political conflict, I'm really just not interested in right now. And I think part of it is also that I'm playing a video game right now that has very similar themes and has like very similar political conflicts. Um, it's a fantasy setting, it just has a lot of the same kind of like vibes and like story beats to what's happening in Genesis of Misery right now. And I just feel like my game is actually doing it better than this book. And so I'm just not feeling it right now, quite frankly, maybe I'll come back to it when book two comes out in the series but I know it is a series and like I don't think book two is supposed to come out until 2024 so like I'm not I don't know like I just don't feel this like immediate need to read this right now so I might just DNF it I'm not sure you you can probably see on Goodreads if I have or not um but anyway that is enough for this check-in that's enough for this vlog because I feel like I've talked for so long um even though I've said very little so hopefully this vlog is watchable if you watched all the way till the end as always I super super appreciate it um but that is it for 
today. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and comment down below. If you can't think of anything, leave me a space emoji, some sort of space related emoji, either like a spaceship or a planet or something. And if you like this video and you want to see more from me, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time. Thank you.